God, please remain standing as we pray. You pray with me, please. Our Father, we thank you for all the blessings you've given us. We know we're unaware of many of them, and we're not thankful for those we do have. We ask that you be with our church today, with our staff, as we worship you, that we not only hear the message of the pastor with our ears, but also with our hearts. We ask that you be with us as we go out into the world, that we may be an example for you. Be with those that are suffering health problems and be with their families as they struggle through to become healthy and be witnesses for you. We just ask that you continue to be with us through this week. We pray in your holy and precious name. Amen. Right now, let's just stand and sing and just honor God with what a friend we have in Jesus.
before you right now, knowing that you're God above all things. Anything that's going on in our lives, anything this world is throwing at us, Lord, you're greater than all those things. You fight for us, you conquer for us, Lord. And now give us a faith to trust that you are God over all things. Lord, help us desire to grow. Help us desire to be more like you. Help us desire to know you on the deepest level, Lord. Help us as parents, Lord, to just raise up our children to love you, to know you. And as a church, I pray, Lord, that you put in us that desire to look and to see all the people that are hurting in our neighborhood, in our city, in our sister city, Lord, and give us a burden to love them so much that we're willing to drop what we're doing so that they can hear the name of Jesus, so they can know the name of Jesus. Lord, we love you. We adore you. We exalt you above all things. In your name we pray. So if you had to choose a song to capture where you are in life today, what would it be? If you happen to be here today and you're struggling under some trials, you might well choose that song by Paul McCartney written so many years ago. When I find myself in times of trouble, how's it go? Come on. Some of you know Beatles music, surely. I know we're not supposed to talk about that in church, but let's go ahead and be real today. When I find myself in times of trouble, Mother Mary comes to me, speaking words of wisdom. Let it be. You know, I heard a year or so ago, the background for that song, Paul McCartney said that it was during one of the recording sessions or times of recording sessions that the Beatles were in towards the end of their career. And the band was falling apart, and they were being torn in different directions. And he said one night as he, was, he went to bed and he was conflicted and concerned and all of those things about the future of that mega band, he began to dream. And he dreamed of his mother, whose name was Mary, who would come to him when he was a child, when he was troubled, and she would always say to him, just let it be. Just let it be. That's the background for the song, Let It Be. If you're here today and you're troubled and the things of your world are beginning to kind of spin out of control, you may well choose that as the soundtrack of your life today. Somewhere I have to find peace and somewhere I have to figure out how to just let it be. Maybe some of us are here today and we have figured out how to handle that, and so we go with Horatio Spafford's great Christian hymn, It Is Well With My Soul. I wonder what should be the soundtrack song of the life of a Christian when it comes to days like this. How about Louis Armstrong's classic? I see trees of green, red roses too. I see them bloom for me and you, and I think to myself, what a wonderful world. Is that, is that your soundtrack this morning? Did you wake up this morning and walk out into the grandeur of God's creation and just burst out singing, what a wonderful world? Or did you wake up with screaming kids and grumpy spouse and think to yourself, oh my Lord, it's another day. Armstrong's song goes on to say, the colors of the rainbow so pretty in the sky. Now, that part we get. But he goes, well, that's not the rest of that whole thought even. The colors of the rainbow so pretty in the sky are also on the faces of people going by. Did you see that when you got to church this morning? The colors of the rainbow in people's face. They're just so happy to be alive. Maybe not yet, huh? I see friends shaking hands saying, how do you do? And they're really saying, I love you. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. What is the soundtrack of your life playing today? 
Maybe another way for me to get us into this discussion is to ask you, what are you trying to build in your life today? About a year ago, I decided to take up woodworking. I needed a hobby because I didn't have enough to do with my time. And so I decided that I would pick up woodworking. And so uh, we needed a shelf built in the garage of the house that we, uh, that we owned back in Lumberton. And so uh, I bought a few of the tools that I needed and kind of started that lifelong process of buying tools. That's for my wife to hear, just so you know. <laughs> she said, nice try. Uh, and so I built a shelf, and I was proud of it, very proud of it, until I started letting people know that I was taking up woodworking, and so real woodworkers started talking to me, and even this week had the opportunity to visit in the home of some of our church members. They took us back to uh, showing us their house, and there's a crib back there that was built by a master woodworker, and I decided I should sell my tools You see, here's, here's part of the deal for us. We're building a life of some kind. Whether you are doing it consciously or unconsciously or subconsciously, we're all building lives. And if we're not careful, we may get to a point where we're well down the road of building whatever life it is that we're trying to build. And if we listen to the soundtrack of that life, we keep playing funeral dirges that capture how we're doing. The old hee-haw, and some of you won't know this, but some of you will. You know the old hee-haw, gloom, despair. See, every time I start that, people know exactly what it is. <laughs> Deep, dark depression, excessive misery. If that is the soundtrack that your life is playing today, because you're building a life that doesn't seem to measure up, I have good news for you today. Matthew chapter 5, let me invite you to turn there with me. And in Matthew chapter 5, as we step into this, uh, and I ask the question, what kind of life are you trying to build? The reality of our day is that most people in our world, and let's just take American society today as we think through this, we're looking for the charmed life. According to Microsoft and their online dictionary, charmed used as an adjective means unusually lucky or unusually happy as though protected by magic, the charmed life. And most of us, I hope, would quickly say, well, we don't really believe in magic. But I think that we may find ourselves in first century Greco-Roman society because in Greco-Roman society, what we would call the charmed life today came across for them as they were looking for divine favor from the gods. Now, that's gods with a small g, not a capital. But their whole perspective on life seems to mirror 21st century American society because for the first century person, these hillside congregation that Jesus has in the Sermon on the Mount here, they were looking for that charmed life, the life that was marked by a beautiful home or fine children or a great education or wealth or fame or honor. That sounds like 21st century life pursuits, doesn't it? That's first century. The charm life seems to be one of those pursuits, one of those lives that people seek to build, and they, they go as far as they can, and somehow they just need that extra little oomph behind it that, uh, that maybe God will give. The charmed life is not much different today, really. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world becomes the if only soundtrack rather than the what is soundtrack. In the Sermon on the Mount, in this first little section, it's actually the introduction to the entire sermon. We started into this last week in verses 13 through 20, but we're backing up today to the first part of Matthew chapter 5 as we look at the Beatitudes uh, in total today. Now, I'll start tonight unpacking them one by one in our Bible study, as Elvin mentioned already. But in this overview of this, this life, this charmed life that we all seem to seek, Jesus comes and he speaks into it on that hillside with those people gathered there. Jesus, the teacher now, begins to preach. 
And the introduction to his sermon is what we call the Beatitudes, and it is an incredible piece of literature. We find it cross-stitched and framed and hanging on people's walls, and we find all kinds of artistic expression of what the Beatitudes mean. People even memorize them. But what we really need to do is not so much memorize them as internalize them, because Jesus takes the charmed life and all that we pursue and he flips it on its edge. Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. There's a whole sermon in verse 1, but I'm not going to preach that one today, but let's go ahead and read it. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountains, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth, and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And with this, this emphasis on the single word, blessed, Jesus steps into the pursuit of the charmed life. I want to take three different elements of this today and try to lay it out for us. And this is an introductory kind of a sermon for the series. And we're taking enough stuff that's going to take us nine weeks on Sunday nights or eight weeks on Sunday nights to unpack. So stick with me as we get the overview, as we get the flyover version of this rich and deep passage. When Jesus uses this word blessed, and he uses it, uses it so many times in this little section that it had to be one of those things that just reached out and grabbed those first century listeners. Part of the reason for that is because Jesus reaches in to an, a rich Old Testament tradition for them. This idea of being blessed, this, this favor from God that steps down into the everyday life of these people finds its roots way back in the book of Genesis. One of the first times that we see it is when Jacob seeks to manipulate the circumstances and the people of his life so that he can steal the blessing that should have been his older brothers, Genesis chapter 27. Or we could go to the book of Psalms, the very first Psalm, Psalm 1, and the very first verse of the first Psalm where the theologian, songwriter, singer, of Psalm 1 writes these words, blessed is the man, and then he finishes out as he contrasts the life of the blessed as the li with the life of the wicked. Jesus reaches way back into the Old Testament. But for these followers, these ones sitting with him there on that hillside, they probably were much more familiar with the, the idea of the blessed life, of the charmed life, coming out of the exile when it seemed like God had abandoned his people totally. And they were taken off into captivity, some of them never to return. The nation itself never to return to the glory of their father, King David, or at least in their lifetime it had not. And they hear these words, blessed, as Jesus repeats them over and over and over, and in their heads, they must certainly have gone to that place out in the distant future, that hope that they had that, that Messiah would come back someday and he would restore the messed up order of Israel's life, and that in doing that, there would become that day where they would be blessed again. Jesus taps into that exilic hopelessness and he says, blessed are these people. Now, if we were to be laying one gospel over the top of another, we would know that by this time, as Mark records in his first chapter, that Jesus had burst onto the scene in his roughly 30 years of age or so. And when he bursts on the scene of Cana up in that upper part of the Sea of Galilee, he burst on the scene announcing the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven is here. 
And he begins to inaugurate the kingdom of God that they were waiting to see that the Messiah would certainly bring someday. And he says to them, pay attention because God's doing something in our day. And now he takes these blessing statements, eight of them to be exact, even though it's used more times than that. We'll talk about that as we go forward. Jesus takes this whole idea of the charm life in the first century and the 21st century, and he gives us a little bit of insight. Let me just say, I appreciate the, the way uh, Elvin helped us to step into this thought today. Let me just encourage you to be careful about taking Google's definitions about stuff. Actually, happy is the way many translations will take this word. Matter of fact, you may have a translation that one time after another in the Beatitudes it says happy is the person who such. The, one of the, others will say blessed and they just take it at face value. But it's, it's very difficult for us to take this word in the Greek language as it, and pull it over into English. It, it has a rich connotation that English is just not quite as mature uh, as Greek was to be able to communicate what was there. And so maybe the best way for us to take this today is not so much blessed or happy, although I'm fine with those words because they capture part of it, but let's put it in our modern vernacular and let's say that really the idea behind this is Jesus says to these people he describes here as, well, he says it this way, congratulations. This would be that terminology that your family would use with you when you win big at the casino. Oh, wait a minute. We're Baptist Church. That wouldn't happen. <laughs> when you get that great promotion at work, congratulations. It's a term that is rich with this sense of accomplishment. It's a term that fits the charmed life because it's the one that says things are going your way. You're on the upswing here. Way to go. Congratulations. That's this word. Let's stop for a moment and let's just kind of wear this one because I think it's a place we really should do that. Let's take your life and what you're building the things to which you are pushing in life, how likely is it that Jesus would say to you of those pursuits, congratulations? Is it possible that Jesus would take the 21st century American dream, that to which most of us push, or many of us push, that idea, that pursuit of having more money in the bank, you know, the question is asked, how much is enough? And the answer is always just a little more. The American dream of a charmed life, plenty of money in the bank, a trophy wife, a hot husband, kids who are successful. I wonder if Jesus would look at those things and say to us, Congratulations. You've hit upon the life that I have in mind for you. You know, the reality is all of us today are building a life. Are we building the life that Jesus would congratulate us for if we somehow pulled it off? Eight different times Jesus uses the word blessed or as I've said today, congratulations. It's actually used more than that. That last beatitude, the eighth one, is stretches from verse 10 all the way through verse 12. I'll explain that more on Sunday night. But the reality of that is we have eight different beatitudes, eight different statements of congratulation here. Each one of them stands alone. Each one of them has meaning in and of itself. But at the same time, each one of them is related to the other ones. As a matter of fact, as we will see as we work through these on Sunday nights, one of these can stand alone, but it cannot be there by itself because each one builds on the previous one or the the previous ones. On top of that, there is a structure here. They're neatly divided into two halves. I'll get to that at the end of this message today. But each one of them, building on one another, begins to push us to fulfill this whole idea that Jesus says when he says we are to love God and love people. The Beatitudes break out nicely, neatly, very deliberately into the life that is congratulated by Jesus is the one that gets love God right and the one that gets love people 
right. In other words, the life that is to be congratulated by God is the one that understands what love looks like in all of its facets. Bless it. Congrats. Let's pull it apart a little bit because as we work our way through this, one of the things we find is on the back half of every one of these Beatitudes, there are these statements that are instructive for us. They, they are these statements of promise. Notice in verse 3, the, I'll get to the conditions in just a moment, but on the back half, the promise is for this particular person or this particular person or this person with this particular um, condition in their life, uh, the congrats for them is that they, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Verse 4, for they shall be comforted. These are promises of the life. These are markers of the life that Jesus congratulates. Verse 5, for they shall inherit the earth. Verse 6, for they shall be satisfied. Verse 7, for they shall receive mercy. Verse 8, for they shall see God. Verse 9, for they shall be called the sons of God. And then of all things in verse 10 and following, we find here that the last promise is the exact same promise as the first one. For theirs is the kingdom of God. And what that does, Jesus is a master teacher. He's a master speaker. And he uses a rhetorical device here that his listeners would have picked up on from the first century. By using that promise in the first, for theirs is the kingdom of God. In the back, the last one, for theirs is the kingdom of God. What he does is he brackets the entire statement. And he says all of the ones in between are examples and are playing out characteristics of what it means to be in the kingdom of heaven. In other words, he would say to us, congratulations to you when you figure out that life inside the kingdom is the life that brings the stuff you need. Well, let's be honest. The stuff in this list, all of those promises that I just quickly ran through, those don't tend to make the list for 21st century Americans pursuing the charmed life. Oh, we want mercy. And we certainly want some of the other things that are there. We might even want to be called the sons of God. But in the final analysis, we tend to want things in our society today that are not listed in, in those promises. What do you do with that? What do we do as we look for the charm life or the good life as we might call it and we know that Jesus says those things that we're looking for, those things that God has designed for us are found only in the kingdom of God and yet we don't often push for the kingdom of God in our lives. Remember what I said, this is an introduction. What Jesus is doing with these Beatitudes has some very, very specific intents, and we'll talk about that just momentarily, but the reality is Jesus is just kind of laying out for them, uh, I'm getting ready to talk to you about life, and it's going to be different than what you're normally hearing. That's the Sermon on the Mount. I believe you'll hear me say this many times over the coming weeks, that the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus' own capture of what it looks like to live a life of one who follows him. And he is going to push us beyond ourselves in doing it. And so in this uh, first shot, the shot across the bow, we might say, Jesus takes the good life, the charmed life, and the perception of those people who listen to him, and he flips it on its edge and says, if you really want a life to be congratulated, you're only going to find it in the kingdom of heaven. Which means we probably should define kingdom of heaven. I already said that his listeners on that hillside almost certainly would have heard this and pushed it out to some distant future. After all, probably sprinkled on the edges of that crowd were Roman soldiers representing the fact that the children of Israel were no longer their own people. That this heathen, foreign army had invaded and taken charge of them. And even though they had a, a semblance of freedom, they were still under the boot of Rome. 
And so for Jesus to talk about the kingdom of heaven, certainly they would have thought forward to that time when the Messiah would come and give it to them, but they've missed the fact at this point in his ministry that he is the Messiah and that the kingdom of heaven is available to them and to us now. We don't have to wait for heaven someday. Jesus is going to talk about life in the kingdom, and it's going to be about right down here on the bottom shelf of how we live. Congratulations, he says, when you are a child of the king. Very quickly, the conditions that he gives us in this. Well, let me make sure that we get this right. When I say conditions, sometimes we think of conditional, which is if you're going to get these promises, then there's things you have to do. That's not the way Jesus says this. Think, if you will, for me about the weather conditions of the day. In El Paso today, the sun is shining. I think I can say that most days in El Paso, right? That's the condition of the weather. So what Jesus is doing with this is he lays out the condition of these lives. He's not saying if you want these promises, then somehow work it up and become poor in spirit and become merciful. He's not saying you have to work it up. He's just describing people here. Congratulations to the person whose life is marked by being poor in spirit. We'll talk about that tonight. In other words, the conditions begin to point to what that person already has at work in their lives. Those persons who are the mourners are the ones who are comforted by God. This is rich stuff. It's deep stuff. It's a lot deeper than what it looks like just at first pass. The charmed life. The people who have these conditions at work. So let me finish this way. What we will find by the time we get to the end of the Sermon on the Mount is that Jesus is after transformation in our lives. He will never allow us the privilege or the the luxury, I guess I should say, of coming in to being a follower of his and just doing life the way we've always done it. He'll never allow us the luxury of coming to be a follower of Jesus and yet not taking on the life that he offers for us. And this set of beatitudes, the blessed life, the life that is to be congratulated, is the one that understands that and that transformation that comes from being a child of the king. When I was in college... They might have tried to teach me this in high school, but I was not paying attention, just to be honest with you. But when I was in college and I figured out that I was in a course of study that I was going to have to do a lot of reading and a lot of writing, I began to pay attention to what our teachers were trying to tell us about how to write. And so I got to this course where they're teaching us, I think they call it composition and rhetoric, composition being the biggest part of that. You're just going to write forever in that class. And the teacher began after the first assignment. We turned it in, and none of it was any good from anybody, apparently, because the teacher stood up and said, let me tell you something about what you do with a good paper. One of the things you need to do is you need to have an introduction, and you need to have a body, and you need to have a conclusion. And I I sort of understood that, but I didn't totally get it. I was talking with uh, one of my friends one time, and, and here's what they said. Look, when you write, the introduction is you tell people what you're about to tell them. And in the body, you tell them. And in the conclusion, you tell them what you told them. <laughs> Works for me. I figured it out. Let me, let me just give you a little bit of an insight, all right? Let me, when I come up here to preach, I try to have an introduction and a conclusion. I'm in the conclusion, just so you know. <laughs> but the introduction part of it I want to do what I was taught back in college, but I also use the introduction as an attempt to grab your attention because I know enough to know that if I don't grab your attention early, then I'll lose you for the whole 20, 30 minutes, whatever it is that we do here. So the introduction in a sermon especially needs to grab as it tells you what's coming. Jesus masters both of those tasks. In this introduction, he reaches out and he grabs his listeners by using a term that is rich with history for them and loaded with significance for the day. 
And then he is through the rest of the sermon. He's going to tell them what he has to tell them. So I started. Let me go back to the introduction so you know how I tried to do that today. I started off with asking you what the soundtrack of your life is playing today. Is it Armstrong's classic, and I think to myself, what a wonderful world. Are you living the congratulated life so that everything around you looks like it's supposed to look? Most of us don't live Armstrong's song. Maybe every once in a while we get it and everything just looks great. Most of the time, not so. My daughter has a ringtone on my phone that is kind of the song that I have uh, shared with her through the years. Leanne Womack's song, I Hope You Dance. One of the lines in that song has been part of what I've tried to push for Lauren for a long time, and I just want you to give faith a fighting chance. And if you get the chance, dance. A lot of people drag their way through life instead of dance their way through life. I think Jesus is saying to us, to borrow something I said to you a few weeks ago, worship in our lives is like a dance. God leads, we follow. It is a beautiful, poetic life. I hope you dance. But more than that, I want you, and Jesus wants you to have a charmed life where when you look through all of the struggles and all of the trouble of life, you can say, what a wonderful world because you know a wonderful Lord. Is it true for you today? Many, many people populate our churches every week without a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. And we often try to boil that down to some nice, neat little package, some nice little saying that the preacher throws out or some little pre-programmed prayer that we pray and then we think that we've done what we need to do. But the reality is the charm life that Jesus is talking about here, the divinely favored life, the life that Jesus himself would look at you and say, congratulations, you got it, is a life only found in the kingdom of God. Do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ that changes you? How real is he to you today? Let me ask you to bow your heads, if you will. Let's pray together, but as we go into prayer, I'm going to just tell you what the invitation is today. My invitation to you today is that you would step out into a loving relationship with Jesus Christ that changes everything about you. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Do you know that kingdom? Have you experienced the life of that kingdom? Do you know Jesus Christ in a saving way, and a transforming way? If not, then our invitation to you is that you come to know him today, that you reach out to him today and accept the life that he offers to you. If you don't know what that is, this invitation is for you. Come down. I'll be here. Uh, Dr. Nichols will be here. We'd love to share with you the good news of Jesus Christ. Maybe you need to join our church and jump in with a bunch of people who are serving God, trying to help other people find that kingdom life invitation for you is dance. Father, take this time. Use it to glorify your name in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing.